Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to show how to wire up a prototype of all of the intelligent components of the circuit for the Superstar Destroyer. The first thing you're going to do is solder on some headers onto some of the breakout boards. Uh, this particular board is an Adafruit PowerBoost 1000C, which will provide one amp of current and uh, attach to a rechargeable battery, as well as provide a USB port for charging that battery. I'm using that breadboard to hold the headers in place while I solder onto the back of the breakout board. Next up is an Adafruit 12-channel PWM controller based off of the TLC59711 chip. The row of header pins on the right and left side that have five pins are essentially the inputs for the board. There are two sets of headers that can be used to daisy chain multiple boards together. These headers will be used to connect to the power module as well as to the ATtiny85 microcontroller that I'm going to use to control the lights. The sets of six pins that line the outside of the board are the PWM ports for the LEDs. The outermost pin in each pair is a positive voltage, and the innermost pin is a ground. I'm soldering on some triple row right angle header pins. The reason why I'm using triple row is twofold. One is that I'm cutting off one of the rows of the pins each time so that I can get a staggered height for the back row and front row of the LED headers, and the other reason is simply because I didn't have any double row headers on hand. Later on when I reassemble the Star Destroyer, it'll be easier to connect all of the LEDs to the LED controller using a block of connections rather than individual wires. Next I'm going to do a dry fitting of the LED controller and power module inside of the hull of the Star Destroyer. I'm using the large space inside of the main engine block that's on the tail of the Star Destroyer on the underside. I'm also going to test some of these block DuPont connectors to make sure that they fit inside of the entire structure. You'll notice in this case that the straight DuPont headers that are rising straight up are probably not going to fit inside of the hull, which means I'll have to find a different way to connect the power module and the microcontroller later on. Since the components are effectively the same as the Lando's Millennium Falcon that I did in a different video series, I went ahead and stole the firmware and flashed it onto that ATtiny85 controller. I'm using this breadboard to make a prototype of the circuit. This will allow me to test the huge power load from all the LEDs for the Super Star Destroyer, as well as have a test harness for testing individual components. The first thing I've connected are the 5 volt and ground pins from the PowerBoost 1000C to the breadboard. During testing, I'm going to power the entire circuit using the USB port on the PowerBoost 1000C. The next set of connections will be from the voltage and ground pins from the microcontroller to the voltage and ground rails on the breadboard. Since this ATtiny85 is on a dip switch rather than on a breakout board, like an Adafruit Trinket, I had to look on a reference chart to see exactly which legs were which. The firmware from the Landros Falcon sends a digital high signal, which is going to be 5 volts, out of pin number 2. I powered up the circuit via USB, and then used my multimeter to see whether or not there was a 5 volt signal leading from the pin number 2 wire, which is the yellow one, down to the ground wire connected to the ground rail, which is the blue one. This is a good example of what we tend to call in the software industry a smoke test, just to see that, well, all the lights are blinking. The next component to test, which is probably the most complicated one, is going to be the PWM LED controller. Following the wiring diagram that I made for the Lanos Millennium Falcon, I connected pins 0 and 1 from the ATtiny85 to the data in and clock in pins on the 12-channel controller. Next, I connected the power rail to the V plus and ground pins of the LED controller. If you're using different voltage levels, for example 12 volt LEDs and a 5 volt controller, the V plus pin allows you to supply a higher voltage to the LEDs. Next, I'll connect that pin 2 5 volt signal out of the AT1085 into the VCC pin on the controller. This tells the 12 channel controller that we're using a 5 volt logic level. The AT1085 will be sending data in and clock signals at 5 volts. Now for the next smoke test, I'm going to plug one of the outputs, the ground and V plus pins from the LED controller, into an LED and make sure that it lights it up. And nothing happens. I find debugging circuits to be extremely tricky. There are better methods than my go-to jiggling the wires and seeing if any of the lights come on. First thing that I did in this case, which is not something I should have done, was to test to see whether or not I was actually getting a signal coming out of those uh, LED controller pins. The problem here is that I'm testing it using a DC multimeter. The signal coming out of the pins is actually going to be a waveform rather than a constant high signal, which means that the multimeter really isn't the ideal tool for reading the signal. If you want to debug a PWM signal, you really need to have an oscilloscope, which is not a piece of hardware that I have. 
What follows next is a series of what not to do while debugging circuits. Here's me touching the LED to the legs of the controller directly to see if it turns on. Here's me randomly flipping wires around. Please don't do that. Here's me adding a random resistor just to make sure I'm not burning out the LEDs. And then finally I get smart and I bypass the controller just to make sure the LED works by plugging it directly into the power rail. And yes, it does work, so I know I have a good LED. And then I look down and I realize that I have everything plugged into the output side of the LED controller, the clock out and the data out, rather than the clock in and data in. So now I'm soldering on another set of headers to the correct side. And then I wise up and pull out the multimeter to see if I've got any faulty wires. It turns out that the jumper wires that I have lying around in the back of my desk from my previous project are mostly faulty. I test some good wires and finally I have some success. The LED is being lit up by the LED controller. The next thing I wanted to do was a load test on the LED controller ports. In theory, each LED controller port should be able to supply 60 milliamps of current. Therefore, I should be able to drive three 20 milliamp red LEDs in parallel with a 47 ohm resistor. I'm going to do the same thing with a set of white LEDs. One thing you may notice is that the LEDs have a constant brightness. This is because at some point I pulled out the microcontroller and reprogrammed the firmware so that instead of having a glowing engine effect, it was just going to turn on each of the LED channels to its maximum brightness. This is the smart thing to do. Eliminate as many factors as possible while testing, including the software. Once I could verify the operation of the LED controller, I went ahead and reprogrammed the AT8085 to add a glowing effect to each of the channels. Now I know the software works. I think the important things to take away here, especially when testing something as complex as the LED controller's interactions with the AT8085, is to make sure that you test everything in its dumbest possible state before adding complexity. Check to make sure you have good wires and LEDs by testing them with direct power. Check to make sure that your simplest possible firmware that just turns on the LED controller works, effectively a hello world. I'm a software engineer during the day, which is probably pretty obvious. And normally I do the right thing. I write my unit tests, I test each component individually, I do systems and integrations tests, but I thought to myself, eh, I'm on vacation, this is a side project, maybe I can get away with not doing any of these things. It turns out that where physical computing is involved, it's extremely important to do these kinds of tests. Anyway, thanks for watching, and in the next video, I'm going to do some wiring.